Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. Before we start, I want to thank everyone who has supported the show, and in particular those of you who have contributed to the PayPal tip jar. Of course, the likes, subscribes, and shares help a great deal as well. I enjoy bringing you this content, and the contributions help cover the expenses for doing so. I've had a wonderful time chatting with the people on these shows, so much so that I would like to have them back for further conversations. As you listen, if there are any questions or topics you would like to hear us discuss, please post up a note in the comments or send me them directly. I'll pick the best ones and we'll cover them in future episodes. Another way you can get more content is to join the Spirit Aikido online program. There are currently more than 120 videos in the program, with new ones being added every few days. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods that I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. In the most recent series of videos, I cover a number of kick defenses, and I also cover a weaponized version of Hijiotosh. There's a link to the program in the description. I invite you to check it out. Now, on with the discussion. Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. I have really honored to have today uh, Larry Reynoso Shihan joining me for a conversation. Uh, we just met uh, online, had a bit of a conversation to lead up to this interview or this, this discussion, and just had a great time. So I'm really thrilled to have him here. Before I get started, uh, I had a gift show up at the dojo today when I was there for class, and a box came with my name on it. It said Sensei Tristan on it, which I don't know if anybody would send that to me, but uh, I was gifted these uh, couple of books were sent to me, and I just want to thank the person that sent these uh, they're both by the same author. Uh, one's Research of Martial Arts. The other one is The Martial Arts Teacher, both by Jonathan Bluestein. Uh, I don't know if he's the, the author is the one that sent them to me or, or somebody just graciously uh, had, uh, gifted me these, but I just want to uh, express my appreciation and gratitude. Thank you very much. Um, I always view gifts as something very much from the heart. And in the old Viking tradition, when you gave somebody a weapon, it meant that, that you that they trusted you. When they would give you a piece of armor, it means they want you protected. When somebody gives you knowledge and wisdom, to me, that's how I view it, that they want to see, uh, they want to help you grow and they want to add to that conversation, which is very much what this podcast is about, is sharing knowledge, uh, helping others learn, uh, being a mentor and being a student as well. So uh, thank you very much for whoever sent those to me. Uh, I very much appreciate it. So uh, welcome, Shian Larry Renosa, to, to Modern Aikido's podcast. I appreciate having you here. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> I bet. I hope you don't mind being had. <laughs> oh. um, we, had a, we talked about a number of great topics. And uh, just to launch into one, and I just wrote these down here. Uh, first one is, even before the COVID lockdown happened, all instructors, all practitioners really, really should be innovating and are usually innovate not only their art, but their teaching. What are some of the things that, that you found that you were working on when, uh, when you were still working on the mat with students and, and with your instructors and, and that kind of thing? Um, gee, it seems like so long ago that we haven't been on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like a long time. I, I think that, I mean, to be to reflect on some of the things we had grown into, I think one of the most significant things in my particular dojo experience uh, is that we've taken uh, more, more interest in the weapons, perhaps, and started uh, using uh, the foundation of Morihiro Saito, which I trained with uh, many times in the past and with the students up in Northern California uh, many times at uh, several retreats and using that as a foundation to expand mm. and fill in several voids that I thought existed. Um, and I've always said that and always acknowledged Saito Sensei as one of the great teachers of the weapons that gave virtually everybody in the United States, a foundation on which to build. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we took the, I don't know if you're familiar with Saito's teachings, weapons uh, teachings, um, 
I know of them more than having experienced them myself. But as yeah. I understand it, oh, since I never had any katas or any forms or anything like that, and Saito was a, a pioneer of actually putting them to form so that they would be saved and they would be preserved. That's my understanding. One of the first people to write a book, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those books got recognized. And uh, so they they became very popular and people, you know, once you write a book and I wrote a, a book myself uh, that is not necessarily true to form, but once you put it in a book, it starts becoming the truth. You know, people start to read yep. it oh, because he put it in the book. Uh, interesting to me, <laughs> but I did, I, I, I loved his teachings and I worked with a lot of the Saito people around, uh, you know, up in Northern California and Southern California, Southern California, at the time I started in the early seventies, wasn't, uh, as popular, uh, as it was in Northern California because of the influence of Saito. Mm. But for me, what I did, uh, having you know, Saito has a particular style, of course, everybody does. And um, I liked it. Uh, it gave a foundation. But I felt that there were still some things missing. For instance, he taught a, tw a set of 20 subuti with a joe, for instance. And um, then the next thing people tended to learn would be uh, the what they call the 31 kumijo, which mm -hmm. a whole lot of people know. And then that was a partner practice based on a 31 uh, movement kata, mm -hmm. uh, which I started believing that was created wrong because uh, it was all, it, it all began by doing the defensive side of the kata. And I said, but what happened to the kata on the offensive side? Well, we just call that the partner practice. Mm -hmm. and, okay. So we accepted that. And as I grew up in Aikido, you know, I, did what everybody else was doing and, and uh, that was pretty interesting mm -hmm. but given my influence from my former instructor who really turned my life around in Aikido he he, he was the one that uh, in, in 1983 I was ready to quit Aikido after 12 years of Aikido mm -hmm. I was done I was really done with the politics uh, we had had a meeting that just simply blew up in Southern California blew the state apart in California, organizations were fractured even more, and it was just all a political mess. And I decided I was gonna quit Aikido and because I had had it up to here, you know, I just done it. But then this man came into my life and, and he changed my life. And um, so given that influence and my experience with the Saito curriculum, I started thinking outside the box and, you know, these are things that happen when you stay in the game long enough. Like we were talking about, you, you start to have your own opinions, which I really encourage, you know, uh, I would tell my senior uh, instructors in my dojo, I said, what you've got to learn is how to say the same thing in your own words. And, and that big part of uh, bringing up instructors in your dojo, you know, like I said, if you stay in long enough, you're going to, you know, and you gain rank and recognition that you're going to have seniors coming up. And, and that's a very important part because you've got to find your own words. So given that curriculum of Saito influence of my former structure, uh, I started thinking outside the box. So what I did is I, I saw a void between the 20 Sabuti. And if you apply, if you then if you learn the 31 Kata, which was taught really popularly across the United States, there were only eight of those sabuti in that kata. Hmm. So my question was, why are you teaching us 20 sabuti when in fact the next thing we learn is only has eight of those in that kata? That mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. So what occurred to me is that what we need is to, as a begin, taking a beginner from the 20 basic sabuti, we need to build a kata out of all 20 sabuti. Hmm. Make sense? I mean, yep. because yep. that progression makes sense to me then because the next step is that uh then you learn partner practice you know combative technique mm -hmm. and you start putting those together and that's what we call kumi joe fighting with the joe right mm -hmm. so also saito had a basic 10 and mm -hmm. those are 10 basic scenarios that people would learn very popular mm -hmm. and then that was it that was the curriculum Mm -hmm. So 
wait a minute, there's still something missing there because if you only have 10 basics, then how does, how do we take that to an advanced level mm-hmm. without just, you know, Juaza, uh, you know, where everybody just goes for it and just kills, you know, knocks the hell out of each other because <laughs> that would destroy the, 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 the philosophy of Aiki, right? A training at an elevated level without the need for competition or, you know, competitive. Right. How do we, how do we maintain the competitive, uh, the edge, mm-hmm. but not being competitive? So, uh, what I did is I took his basic curriculum and I put them all together because if you're going to learn the basic 10, then the advanced would be uh, a Kumijo made up of all 10 of them, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. And, I, and I've created DVDs and presentations online that uh, demonstrate those two aspects that we took the Subudi and we created a Subudi Kata, which mm-hmm. I am very proud of. Is, uh, nobody else does it. Uh, and then um, I did an advanced Kumijo. So these are some of the things that I feel that can be done by uh, instructors that I've started to do. And is thinking outside of your own way of being taught. And, sure. you know, and, and, and what you're doing in the martial arts, uh, Aikido, the martial side, mm-hmm. is very important because it, um, it will help people understand that Aikido is a real martial art. It's not some just, you know, stylistic art form, but uh, can be used on the street. And uh, I'll take it a step further that, um, you know, I mentioned that I teach at Venture College and have for the last 42 years, but the first 10 years or so, I uh, only taught Aikido. I was fortunate enough to get into uh, my credential, I had a degree uh, from Chico State, and um, I had a football coach that really liked me, and so he said, well, why don't you teach this, you know, so I was lucky enough to get into the curriculum at Venture College, which I highly recommend to anybody because what it's led to now is a, a virtual platform on which to continue to teach, mm-hmm. and which is fortunate for me because I still get a paycheck, <laughs> and it also serves to feed your dojo well we don't have dojo anymore right now i mean uh you said you went to class we can't have we can't go into class they just shut us down to purple yeah. again so now uh gyms fitness centers you're done you you don't you can't even go outside mm-hmm. so uh in california and it's, it's really bad here you know and yeah. to me it's all politics it's all bs you know but right that's my own first and i won't go into that but <laughs> the the fact the fact of the matter is that you learn to adapt. And what I did is they, they canceled two of my Aikido classes. And then one of my close friends at the college, he said, well, listen, why don't you just change the name? And I said, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He says, why don't you, I don't know, change it to like, I mean, what is Aikido? And I said, well, it's a, it's a non-competitive form of martial, uh, self-defense. Mm-hmm. And he says, there you go. Call it self-defense, self-prevention. Mm-hmm. And so I said, hmm, well, that's what it is to me. Although if you go to Homba Dojo and you talk to the directors there, they're going to tell you, don't call it self-defense. This is Aikido, love, harmony, not self-defense. We don't want you to teach. We want you to teach like, you know, the founder and we want you to teach like the Doshu, you know, <laughs> especially when you're given the title of Shihan. I, I don't know what rank you are and I don't know if you've gone through that process, but it's a, it's a great honor for sure, yeah. and I really uh, it, it doesn't change me. That that's the you know uh, what, one of the ways I think that that you can look at it like any art. If like let's say you were a guitar player and I learned to play guitar from you, it wouldn't mean that I play guitar just like you do. So yeah. when you transmit an art, it does evolve based on what that the student makes of it, and and it will be its own unique thing. And I and I think that. As, as any art gets more strict in terms of form or strict in terms of constraint, then the, the freedom to innovate starts to diminish. And if anything, being able to take the components of what that art is, whether if it's music, you're talking about chords, keys, scales, um, that type of thing, and how you assemble them into music will vary from artist to artist. And I think that 
Aikido shouldn't be viewed or any martial art should not be viewed as this monolithic template that has to be identical from practitioner to practitioner. It should be each practitioner gets puts their their own spirit or their own heart into it to get out of it what they can do. And that may go, that may be totally different than their instructor. I know my Aikido is very different than my instructors was, or even many of my mentors, my art is different. Uh, but well, I think it's, what... it doesn't have to be identical, but they will have many common threads of all the mentors that I've ever worked with. I'll take a little bit of this and, and that to find things that are effective and make them work for my art. Um, yeah, one of the things you find in Aikido, I think you uh, will probably agree that uh, when you're talking about what you just talked about, uh, they don't want to hear that at Humba Dojo. Right. They, they don't want to hear that at the traditional headquarters of World Aikido mm -hmm. because that that's going away from the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know anything about the Japanese tradition, mm -hmm. uh, as I see it, my personal view uh, that I've been criticized for uh, on, on many levels, but uh, is to say that the, the Doshu's job, you know, Morotiru Ushiba, mm -hmm. who is a very dear friend of mine, and we've gotten along, we've got a good relationship. I know a lot of people say that, but um, it's true. Uh, but, uh, you know, his job is to preserve the tradition of Aikido, the way it was taught and will be taught in the future in the past and the future and um that's his job and i think people outside of that world you know will make the mistake of thinking that that's their job as well no i'm a student i'm a student of aikido and my job is to make it better that's right. the way I, my job is not to to practice it as it has been done in the past i mean that's what we do because that's how we get we create our foundation of understanding we understand Aikido for, you know, I go, all, I started Aikido in 1974, but, um, you know, I, I was blessed with great teachers and a variety of teachers uh, involved in the United States Aikido Federation, uh, made enemies of a lot of people, you know, simply because of the politics, but grew out of that and ultimately found an instructor that says, I just, we don't need an organization. All we need to do is train. Mm -hmm. And that got changed my mind because all of a sudden here I found somebody that didn't give a crap about the politics. He just wanted to train and mm -hmm. train we did. And, and I learned that Aikido was a true form of martial arts and a true way of Bushido. And as I said in my uh, text to you, I think I sent a message, Aikido wa Bushido de Aru, which simply means Aikido is the way of the warrior. Aikido, now, O Sensei was uh, uh, quoted as saying Aikido wa Budo de Aru, which means Aikido is Budo, mm -hmm. right? And, and of course, I've had people say, well, I've never seen that quote. Well, you know, I read the same books you did, and so I read it, and I've never forgotten it, especially after the influence I received from my last teacher, who I broke away from in 2001. And um, so the thing is that I, I absolutely agree with you that, you know, we have to think beyond, and, and not only beyond what is popularly taught, but start turning inwards to your own truth, mm -hmm. to your own ideas, you know? And if you've been trained well, and if you've been trained long enough, you'll have that strength and right. that courage without yeah. having to make anybody else wrong. Right, you know? and, and that's the one thing, like in the way that I look at it, any martial artist that wants to create a, a uniform product is kind of like McDonald's makes its hamburgers. Like if they yeah. want to make their students like McDonald's hamburgers where they're all identical, now you're, that's where the politics comes into play. If you have a mind where if like you taught guitar, you want to teach five really good guitar players, they don't all have to play like you. They don't all have to play like each other, but they have to be able to play the guitar. Like right. they can't just <laughs> swing it over their head and, and, you know, bash it around and they think like they're a guitar player. And I, and I think that's the, na the nature and the difference between a, a science and an art. A science is re uh, repeatable. Like you want to get very precise, uh, consistent, identical results. But with an art, you have the path that you now combine that with the passion. You want to get positive results. You, you certainly can't get negative results, especially when you come to like a self-defense type of a situation. You don't want to risk having 
failure, uh, but the expression is going to be different for different people. And it's just, you're, we're not going to be McDonald's hamburgers. We're going to be students right. of the art. And that's true. And, and like I say, living into our own truths uh, is very important because my, my teacher, my former teacher, uh, you know, convinced me that there has to be certain components in our practice, regardless of what you do. You know, now I just happen to do Aikido and he does too. And he loves Aikido and he, he taught me to, he, he really gave me the courage to, to love Aikido uh, as a true way of martial arts, simply because the, of the components. And the components to me are consist of number one, the theory of technique. Okay, well, we all do that and we all get very good at it. I mean, if you stick with it, you, you know, have half a brain, you can start learning technique anybody can learn technique and that was where they they i think uh, the humba dojo and then some of the more traditional aikido dojos made their mistake because it was all about technique mm -hmm. you know it, it, they they didn't go beyond that and they all their testing was not testing it it was uh in my mind in my right. humble opinion it was recital it was a recital absolutely yeah. Yeah. and so what we had, what I was exposed to, and what I agree with is that testing should be a test. There's got to be a component of the unknown. Right. And there's got, so that's where we started embracing uh, the concept of not a recital. Where, in other words, say for instance, take a fifth Q test. Uh, it, my strategy for fifth Q testing is a basic level. First Q testing is to learn how to roll, learn how to protect yourself and fall into the mat. Because if you can't protect yourself and in fall into the mat, then you can't participate in any of the advanced training. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be thrown. Nobody can throw you because we'd be too afraid of you getting hurt. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big deal uh, to me. So, and that test is very difficult because the ultimate test is having three people grab you, push you, throw you any way with, until you're completely exhausted, until you think you're gonna die and then at some point in time, I'll say, okay, enough. But it's, a, it's a, actually a measure of your stamina, your endurance, and your determination to continue beyond where you think you can continue. The fourth Q test goes up a level, but it's not, once you, be, what, once you become what I call mat proofed, then the next level is to, okay, can you defend yourself against a grab, punch, or kick? Mm -hmm. Okay, and when, we, when I'm talking about a punch, grab, or kick, I mean, a grab, punch, and a kick. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm going to punch you, I'm going to punch you. And it's going to go to your face. It's going to punch in the face, punch in the gut, but it's an honest punch. And that's where you learn the concept of not only honesty, but the true value of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't avoid getting punched, you're, you're, you're not training anything that's worth anything, right? I mean, it's just, just as basic as it gets, right? So Great, my... Yeah. My first, my three basics became in that level, avoid, control, choose. Those are my three, that's my mantra. Mm -hmm. and three basics of Aikido is avoid, choose, control, and choose. You've got to be available, I mean, uh, able to avoid being punched, grab, kick, stab, shot, hit with a brick, mm -hmm. hit with a piece of pipe. Uh, all that's involved. And then you've got to be able to control not only yourself, but your opponent. And then you've got it in the instant truths. Those are three moments in time. So avoid being hit, get control, and then choose what you're going to do once you have control. People don't understand that because right. they it's all about technique. But if you've only got technique, Jack, and some dude comes and wants to kick your ass, I mean, you're done in a, in a heartbeat. You know, one shot. Most fights are one punch affairs. And so this is where I see other people flying to the other side because they can't understand how to to keep the cohesiveness of aikido together because all of a sudden now they're in the you know classical aikido doesn't work and i we need to fight we need to go in the cage to test ourselves and and they they don't understand because that if you if you embrace those three concepts then aikido fits perfectly right. because you have to learn to avoid and so that's my fourth cue how to avoid being punched, grabbed, or kicked. I don't give a damn about technique. I don't care whether they can do a kaitenage or shihonage. I don't care. Because if they can't avoid being punched, grabbed, kicked, 
hit with a brick, hit with a club, hit with a uh, uh, tackled. tackled. Yep. Uh, you, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, any of that stuff, then any technique that you learn beyond that, it's worthless. Absolutely yep. worthless. And so that's what I, I think is very important. Then the third cue going up from there is where you have to start learning the actual technical names so that we can identify those things that we want to learn. Mm -hmm. But at that level, the testing is mostly comprised of, okay, you got a guy that's going to grab you, punch you, kick you. I'm going to tell you what they're going to do. And then you have to do three techniques, any, anything that you want, any three that you think are going to work or in that moment that they do it, you know, are there exist, right. Are present. And you've got to choose those on your own. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. So that third level, which is what we call a third Q, which is a, in most schools, a very low level test. Mm -hmm. Mine's not, it's not, it can't be right. because they're having to now respond spontaneously. They're having, you know, in that moment, and I'm not going to tell them what to do, but here the, some guy's going to punch him, punch in the face. Okay. Choose. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I don't care what you do but do something. And then that you have to pull from that library of techniques you've learned over the years and, you know, over the, that you've trained then once, and then associated with that, uh, at the end of that test, when you're completely exhausted from doing technique, because I say from every grab punch kick that we have, you're going to have to do three techniques. Then the level up from there at, oh, at the end of that test, then we do what we call Taisabaki. And every has their own version of Taisabaki. Well, here's my version. Three people coming at you full speed and you keep them off you. They're going to push you or grab you, okay, or punch you. But they're going to just, go, they're not going to, if they connect, they're going to let go. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is just to keep them off of you. It's kind of like a dog fight. Keep them off you. Yeah. And it's all about don't get pushed down go don't get knocked down and if you get knocked down you better get your butt up, mm -hmm. get up because they're not going to stop and a lot of people like to stop they say okay okay that's enough no 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 you don't get to say i stop mm -hmm. you don't get to say i quit because in a real fight in, in, on the street you don't get to say that either mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? that's where i'm coming from with this and and this is when we really start differing from the classical style mm -hmm. because and as soon as I've been to so many tests in other schools, and as soon as it starts getting, they the, either the guy that gets tired uh, or, or not. I, I was at a dojo in Chicago, uh, someone you know and have interviewed. Mm -hmm. I won't name names, but he asked me to test three people. His girlfriend, who was a young little 20 year old, uh, his, one of his best friends, who was an older guy, and is probably in his 50s. And he wanted to be, have me do a conversion test and rank him higher than he was. I think he had a need on. And then one of his former students that I had actually given us a need on too. And um, so we did the test and, and uh, you know, one of the things I, I like to see in my tests is that, can you understand my way of teaching? If you're gonna represent me, if I'm gonna give you rank, you need to represent me, right? I mean, this is every teacher's goal is to teach them the things that you think you know, right? That you know best. And so I did that. And well, the little girl, well, young lady, um, terrific, but you know, I, I mean, she was, you know, she was, it, so from Sawadi Waza, she was throwing people three times her size off the mat and they were doing flying ukemi from Sawadi Waza, from mm -hmm. a city. How do you do that? How, how are you managed to do that? I can't do that. How are you managed to do that? Well, it was all classical Aikido. I said, that's not my style of Aikido. This is not, that's not what's going to work in the real world. If you get a, somebody is in a, in a seat position and comes and grabs you and chokes you out, they're not going to fly off the mat for you in some preconceived, you know, fluffy move. Mm -hmm. Follow? Anyway, so I, I failed her. And then the, then the next guy, the older gentleman, the good friend you know he, he he started out okay but halfway through the test he just collapses i just collapses he's done okay you know 
thought he was going to have a heart attack, you know, and I say, oh, shit, what are going to do here? And, uh, and so I said, okay. Uh, he says, I, I, I can't do it anymore. I said, okay, that's fine. Fine. You're done. I failed him. Well, you didn't get right. You, you didn't, didn't complete pass. the test. Yep. Complete the test. You, you didn't do anything. So the third one, uh, you know, really great young guy. And I told him, I said, you haven't learned one thing beyond where I trained you it, it was your knee done. And I know you moved away for two years, but I told you, you have to still train. Mm -hmm. And now you're two years later, you come back here and you're still doing skills that you're still missing certain skills that I, you were missing then. I wanted to see you improve. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I failed them. I said, you know what? I, I'm sorry. I cannot pass any of the three. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that person who hosted me couldn't get me to the airport quick enough. Wow. And it, Excuse me of every living thing in the world. I was bad. I was, I was something, you know, and I said, no, I'm honest and I'm not going to give rank to anybody that cannot live into that standard because if they think that they're representing me and they can't do that, that's me being dishonest. But that's where so many teachers have, you know, gone because they simply don't want to lose students. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose students either, but by God, I, I will quit right now if I can't teach honestly and have that kind of honesty in those tests because, damn it, Aikido is a martial art that can live on the street. And so my methodology is once, so anyway, that was an example of, you know, how severe the testing can be and that I'm going to be honest with them if mm -hmm. they can't into that that uh, level that standard uh, you know that that story kind of points out yet another it's just a great testament to the fact of what does testing for rank introduce in terms of politics like you uh, could well, say that with that nothing good i mean yes I, uh, having you having your you as a practitioner having your skills put to the test is is a solid concept but allowing things I guess the aftermath like that, where you have but, yeah, but there's tension within the relationship or what have you come into it. Like, I don't even know if they, if that well, is positive, you know, the only reason the tension comes into it though, is that the, the, the fear of, of having to be held to accountable, right. you know, and that accountability was reflected in those three students testing. Uh, I always say, you know, whenever you travel don't don't tell them where you came from you know because if you do something wrong uh basically a good teacher there won't won't blame the student he'll blame me he'll blame, I'm, <laughs> I, uh, he, my former teacher i mean i i loved him to death but um the thing is when i brought somebody to him for testing and they went through this you know uh <laughs> They, they could do anything wrong and they're not going to get blamed. Right. I'm going to get blamed. Exactly. I what? have to hold myself to a, a standard in mm -hmm. order to, you know, pass that on. And sure. for me, when you look at my record in the Don ranks I have, I don't have thousands and thousands, but by God, I would stand by them in a battle any day of the week. Right. Any day. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, because again, the components of the testing will stand up in a court of law, for, for instance. That's why, uh, you know, um, and, uh, just to complete my Don uh, curriculum, it's the second QC then goes to four techniques from every attack. And then the first Q goes from five techniques from mm -hmm. every attack. In other words, you have to do That's five very similar to the system that I inherited too. Uh, okay. Including the, the we, we, we call it Rondori, but primarily it's a just stay well, alive, stay on your feet, avoid getting controlled by multiple attackers that are barreling at you so um, yeah well that's the that comes after all of this other stuff right right you do, you do five techniques that's the the technical part of the test is you do five techniques from every attack in mm -hmm. other words you do five techniques uh chocolate ski uh you know uh mm -hmm. the, any, any of the attacks grab katatori rio katatori rio tatori uh all these techniques, all, all the attacks, you have to do five techniques. After that, then you do the Rondori. Right. The Rondori, uh, of course, is three people. 
And I like three because it's the most difficult. If mm -hmm. you have five, there's too many. And if you have only two, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so the three man Rondori uh, got built into my head that is really a valuable tool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is you say, ready, set, go. And you, their, their job is to take you down and your job is to not go down. Mm -hmm. And that's the rules. And uh, it's very interesting to see what happens. And, you know, everybody goes down. Yep. that's not the point the point is to see you go beyond where you where you think you can go and and be led into that uh area where uh, of the unknown where you don't know what you're going to do you don't know how it's going to come out and, and at the point that you think you're going to die that you're able to push through you know and actually survive and of course that's where the growth takes place and that's the way we test and that's the way we train we train for the street. I say, you know, the thing is, uh, is one of the things that I, I like to say that, you know, we, we train in the theory of the dojo on a day-to-day -day basis, but where our goal is to build that iconic, you know, arch Japanese bridge over into reality, because that's where we live. And if you can't take one to the other, if you can't take the theory of the dojo to the street, then what's the point? And I'll tell anybody that. What is the point of what you're doing? And that's what's gotten me in trouble quite a bit, of, you know, with a lot of people that I've held to a high standard because they they get pissed off if I don't, you know, if I don't pass them, if I don't, if I don't, you know, automatically rank them. You know, it's a because there's so many instructors and uh, you know uh, that are still teaching that that have completely adulterated the t whole testing program. Nowadays, I, I say, you know, the, the black belt test, the black belt is nothing but a marketing tool anymore. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, there's, there's no value <clears throat> at, at a marketing tool. And I mean, there's e black belt you might, and, and, you know, that's where a lot of these people are going e black right. belt, They're giving black belts online, send yeah. me a video. And that's one of the reasons why I just never really mentioned my rank because it's not important. If somebody asks me, well, what is your rank? I now know that where their mind is. Like they want to know what certificates I've got. I don't really care about any of that stuff. I want well, to know what I, what I can do with my hands and my body. Like that's the important. I factor. agree. Yeah. I agree with you. you'll never be successful in a dojo mm -hmm. if you don't have rank. That's the problem. That's that's the irony of the whole thing because you know um, you have to be seen as a leader. You have to have yeah. rank order to be recognized as the leader. Uh, mm -hmm. And at one point in time uh, with my former teacher, I, we had a discussion about that because, you know, he didn't give a crap about that either, but mm -hmm. he was a sixth Don, he was sixth degree black belt. Mm -hmm. Well, because he was sixth Don, he got recognized, right? So you're, you, you have to have that conversation. I, I know that I understand where you're coming from, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have to have that legitimate conversation about rank authentic rank in the lineage that you want to represent and that's why i've always thought it's important to have uh ranking within that lineage to o sensei in my case in aikido in order to be you know um uh by, go by the rules of the organization and have autonomy to build your own organization if that's what you want to do which is what i wanted to do because i wanted to be able to rank people you know and give rank and to hold people accountable that's that was the key if you don't have the power of ranking if you don't have the the authority or the authenticity uh, authentic rank in any you know whatever organization you're in and a lot of people just don't give a crap about organization well you got to have that conversation too, because how are you going to exist? How are you going to lead, you know, people forward? And what happens after you leave? You know, I'm facing retirement now. I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, considering, you know, just, you know, where I want to see Aikido go is to have people understand my concepts, because I think that my concepts can live into the real world. And, and this is where you're going. This is why I'm even talking to you, because what I hear is in your voice, in your in your speaking, is a genuine uh, uh, a genuine 
compassion for seeing Aikido exist beyond what's going on. Mm-hmm. Aikido is a dead art. Aikido is going to be a dead art soon. I mean, well, I, you know, before we jump to the envision of where it's going in, in 10 or 15 years, I just want to say when we talked previously, you, you brought up kind of a, a very profound uh, statement, and that is, and it wraps up what you've just been talking about the last five or 10 minutes, which is you were ready to quit Aikido before you found a new way of looking at it. And that new way of looking at it was more practical, more self-defense oriented, took other influences and and honed it and developed a training method to bring those things out. Not that you changed Aikido, you merely changed the way that you looked at it. And that refreshed your passion for for the art. And and I, I wanted to just mention that because we talked about it before we started recording about that. And I think it connects through with what you're, what you're saying. Like th- it was, it seemed like a, a serious developmental threshold that you crossed. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it was very much so. I mean, it changed my entire way I saw Aikido you know, because I, I saw uh, the way it was being developed in the United States uh, with the influence of Yamada, uh, Kanai, uh, you know, all the people that were being sent to the United States and teaching, and then the people that were uh, developing under them, like the people up in Northern California under Saito, uh, Sao Tome, you know, all the people that were influencing people in Aikido in the United States were, fra- were just destroying Aikido for their own politics. Mm-hmm. That really became what very, very apparent to me because I was very involved in the United States Aikido Federation, which was the organization that was supposed to be, you know, uh, you know, developing Aikido in the United States. But of course, in in the early, uh, well, it was in, uh, when was it, 80, 1980 or something like that, where, where uh, the Northern California Aikido people uh, from the United States Aikido Federation yeah, and because, uh, you know, Yamada was running a monopoly on the East Coast and having all the black belt seminars and all the all the membership money was going to Yamada. And of course, uh, you know, people didn't didn't like that. And so they seceded. And once they did, uh, because according to the International Aikido Federation bylaws, there was only supposed to be one national uh, organization representing each country, each country was to have a national organization Aikido federation was that organization once they uh, were able to you know convince uh Homba dojo that the united states is too big you know it's a, it's a big country and too many too many people doing aikido we needed to open the doors for more organizations and that of course that opened the floodgates and, and then everybody started having their own organization once they once they did that which was part of the historical development of in aikido but that's again, lent itself to the political differences that everybody started having and because they wanted to accrue members and, and use testing and, you know, black belt to gain power and all that other kind of political BS. And of course, uh, you know, that's what started influencing my uh, dislike for Aikido at that time because it started becoming just a political game. And I, I needed something more. I mean, I came from the body. I, I played division two football. I that middle linebacker. I, I was a fighter. I, I like to fight, you know, it's bring me a, put me in the middle of a defensive fracas and I, I'm in heaven, you know, but, but the thing is after college, after all that ended, you know, I was looking for something that was, you know, active based on, but I hated the martial arts because of the egotism and the, you know, the, the, the pageantry and the six foot trophies. I, I didn't care about any of that, you know, because I knew the real world. I mean, I, I mean, I sit on the sidelines and I can kick his ass. I can kick his ass. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you could, it's kind of like when I got involved with teaching cops, uh, a lot of cops, um, it was interesting for me because they came from an OBS world, right? I loved getting people from other martial arts like karate and, and jujitsu and uh, because they they came, you know, thinking Aikido is this uh, innocent, nice martial art. You know, I, I'm, tired, I'm <laughs> doing, tired of doing it the hard way. I want to come and do it the easy way. I right. go, oh, right, okay. <laughs> they didn't last long. Right. <laughs> school because you know i've met a number of instructors generally from other arts that that 
it started in Aikido and they ran into the wall of politics and the wall of the BS wall. The, you know, I want, I want this to work. And they left, what they told me is uh, they left because they wanted to really do a martial art and they just didn't feel like this was the, that Aikido was the place for them to do that. So they drifted into things that were, that did have a practical base. And that, that kind of breaks my heart. And I would love to see those people have an Aikido to come to when they say, you know, there's stuff I really love about Aikido because they all said the same thing. I, I was drawn to it. I loved it. I did it for a while. And I realized that there was, there was not the practical end of it. And that's what I wanted. I, I'd put in a couple of years where I was, you know, theoretically building the base prerequisite knowledge to get into that practical part, but it just wasn't there. And I, I waited and I, I expressed interest in it, but that was never explored and they got kind of frustrated and then the politic thing that said between the two of those i'm going to go find something else and that's really sad because it's those people's passion that will hold an art over right. time that will make it give it longevity that happened to a lot of people especially yeah, me. and uh you know i was fortunate to to find an instructor that was you know really believed in aikido as, and had developed he i mean quite frankly he was a genius yeah. his genius was to maintain the integrity of the philosophy in Aikido and be able to talk that. And then, but his Aikido was like, holy crap. You know, it wasn't dependent upon you know, the partner to fall down or to hang on or to fall down when I say go and, and, and all that other fluff stuff that we see in stylistic Aikido. I'm not against stylistic Aikido. Let's make that perfectly clear. Because when I go to Omba Dojo, I love training with the Doshu. And I can train with it. Any of my students can train with them and have no problem. But if they were to come to my dojo and, you know, train at that level, they would have a problem because it would be so foreign to them because they, they have stopped thinking of Aikido as a martial art. And, and that's been very, very um, evident and actually articulated to me directly saying Aikido is not a martial art. Aikido is not self-defense. Aikido is a way of being. And I said, well, that's okay. But, you know, then what purpose do I have in teaching Aikido in the real world? Mm -hmm. If you want to be indoors, read fiction all day, that's fine. And, you, and you want, you do you want to... Think you know, that, uh, that that those conflicting views are, are going to become more difficult as time goes on for you to sure. remain genuine to yourself and, and in, not in for the me. face of the vision of what... Aikido no, is doing with what they think Aikido should be? Well, not for me. I'm too damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've got my way and, sure. and leave in my way. And that's, that's another evolutionary thing I'll, I'll mention to you, Tristan, because I think at some point in time, you start understanding what you what you're talking about is what you actually really believe. It's it, without anybody else's influence. I I was under the influence of my former instructor for a long time. I gave him 20, 20 years of my life, and I I you know I'm so grateful for my experience. Uh, but once he started becoming more and more involved in I in Hollywood and making movies and becoming famous, and I saw the other side. I started the dark side starting to formulate. And, and I said, you know what, I can't, I can't do this. And I, I came to a crossroads where I was going to uh, build a college and, and uh, you know, uh, perpetuate his teachings. But I came to my, I had to be honest with myself. So I, I can't, I can't turn my head anymore. You know, I can't look the other way anymore. What you're doing is wrong and I got to get out of here. And so I did. And that's what changed me. And I would just like you did, you know, you're not necessarily going to teach the same way because if you maintain your integrity with the philosophy of Aikido, mm -hmm. everything you do is going to be about other people because you care about what you do that has value for other people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I love the college class, for instance, and teaching with, I, I mean, I get a hundred new students every 16 weeks. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't know anything. Right. And you're going to give them, like you said, a gift. And, and, you know, they're going to, some of them are going to really get it and, and come to you back to your dojo and some will get it. It'll be a value. And then they'll move on. I started losing a lot of those Aikido students. So when I changed to self-defense and self-prevention, 
it was very interesting what happened because that I'll still remember the very first semester I changed it <laughs> because I, I mean, I, my Aikido class were 50, 60 strong, right? Each class. Well, here's the first class I taught self-defense and assault prevention. I got nine students to come to that class. Huh. I had, I had two gay kids. I had two goth kids that came in with black all over them. Uh, they, uh, then I had, two, I think, young ladies that were French, uh, I don't know, whatever they were. And I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, what the hell did I do? What, what did I do? Did I, this is a freak show. This is turning into a freak show. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, what the hell, do, now what do I do? Sure. And I, then at some point in time, you know, I, I'm saying, I'm looking at these people and, and these are all the freaks of nature. You know, these are the freaks in our society, I'm thinking, you know these people, but then I, all of a sudden it dawned on me. No, these are the people that actually need what I have. Yeah. Right. They got gay guys, transgender. Now I got trans kids. I got, you know, and these are people that are desperate, that have been abused, that have been hurt, that have been, you know, mm -hmm. and what can I do for them? I could teach them Aikido, mm -hmm. the, the real world in what fits in the real world. Right. And so that's what started igniting my passion again and it actually saved me from following my uh, continuing following my former instructor into the abyss into the dark side which is he, where he's totally gone and of course that's why he's a, a russian expatriate now because he's if he comes back here he's going to get in trouble but the thing is i found the true value of aikido right there and and if you want to call it self-defense self-prevention that's fine. If you want to call it Aikido, that's fine. Because you know what? In my world, they're the same thing. It's just that uh, we go back to how it's presented. Because if you go to the college administrators, they're not going to give me three Aikido classes and say, wow, what you're doing is a great job. They see a martial arts class. Okay, that's one. You get one of those. And then, oh, you've got a self-defense and self-prevention class. That, yeah, we need that too. Uh, so we can have that too. They, <laughs> You know, it's the same thing. It's sure. just in a different and, and that's the, what we have to do is develop and evolve the value of what we do in Aikido so that people will find a way to listen to it and, and benefit from the value of it that you and I both know is there. I love and, how you succinctly you put that, evolve the value of Aikido. And, yeah. and I, I think that it's far more than, than Kodagash or just some techniques, things like that. It's, it's how profoundly it can change your life or... The lives of the people around you and that's where you go back to the purpose of it tristan i mean the purpose of it is not to be able to do fifty thousand techniques i do a math problem with my students in the self-defense class if i taught you five techniques today and i did that every day for the next five i mean seven days for a whole week how many techniques would you know that okay you know 35 okay that's good good math okay if i did that for the every every week of the year that let's just take two weeks off for vacation. So 50 times, uh, right, 35 is uh, what, 1,700 techniques. That's great, you know, 1,700 techniques. Now I do that for the next 50 years. Okay, that's about 250,000 techniques. Now, wow, that's really great. But how many ways are there to kill you? How many ways are there to hurt you? Mm -hmm. Well, there's infinite ways. Well, then you don't know much if you still know, only know 250,000 techniques. So what's the point? The point is not to use learn technique it's not what it is is to learn to be creative in the moment right. because you have no fear you have you're not you're not you know stopped by your fear you know gavin de becker put it in his book the gift of fear great it, book fantastic book and i mean it's either fear is going to help you or it's going to stop you mm -hmm. so all our training has to be about fear mm -hmm. you know learning how to control our fear or use fear you know and and if our training regardless of what kind of art form you are jujitsu shotokan i don't care but it has to have that quality and i love aikido the way i see it is because and what i've evolved into training is because it does just that mm -hmm. if our students i mean i don't care where you put them 
they'll they'll be able to adapt and that creativity that goes back to my you know my mission statement i know all of us have one but my mission is to really provide the teachings of aikido that empower every student with the courage to be different the courage to be unique mm -hmm. and the creative thinking to make good choices because what else is there in life you you better make good choices or you're screwed you know in that moment of life or death you know uh, you choose left, you choose, he chooses right, head on collision, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So if our teaching doesn't do that, then you're really, you know, paddling upstream and you're doing, you know, there's nothing worth that you're doing that's worth much. Exactly. And if your training isn't challenging you, you're, you're coasting. You're just you're on cruise control and kind of having fun and dressing up like a martial artist and kind of dancing around like one, but it, and you there's have no heart to it. You have to grow both ways because people don't understand that when they're 25, 30 years old at the peak of their health and, and, and shape, you know, uh, physical abilities. But as you grow into your 40s and, and a lot of people are maturing in their art and getting rank and, and all that type of thing. And then all of a sudden they start reaching their 50s and they're, a lot of this kind of combative attitude, combative activity is catching up to you. Mm -hmm. um, 50s then you reach your 60s and then all of a sudden you start questioning what the hell am i doing this for <laughs> you know but right. uh, but you start finding ways to justify it right because at that level in your 60s you're generally you know up at fifth sixth on and people are recognizing you if you're worth anything and so you're able to keep things kind of together and, and run a dojo have a good program because you have high rank and, and you have worth people, parents see value in what you're doing with their kids and, and so on and so forth. But once you start reaching your seventies, you really start, okay, hmm, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Am I just spinning my wheels? Cause it's not about me. It right. has never been about me. It's gotta be about the teachings and the value of what you're teaching. And, and what you're sharing with people that is going to live beyond you. That kid that came to you in your self-defense class and he had been abused by the 16 year old kid that was, you know, boy that was raped by four other boys, you know? What about him? What, you know, what have you given that kid that's going to help him live his life? Mm -hmm. And that, that becomes that my, my objective. That has become my objective because uh, every semester, what keeps me in the right perspective, having both an Aikido class and a self-defense and self-prevention class, which uh, I, I cur I'm currently teaching those two. And it's really interesting how I've evolved a way of talking Aikido to these people and yet talking Aikido to these people and not having them know it's Aikido, you know, right. and, and having the same value. Because if you go on if you go through my curriculum, I'm talking about, you know, talk about possibility, creating themselves as a possibility, uh, overcoming their fear, uh, sharing themselves. What could I do to be a better person, you know? And what you, what you understand, what you and I understand is that in the dojo, when you're learning these techniques and learning that, you, you know, uh, a progressive manner, how to go slow, and then you can speed up, and then you get to something like Tai Sabaki, which is completely un- scripted you know and and people are knocking you down uh, or being challenged in the test like i said in chicago where i tested and failed those people i did a test and in germany did the same thing after the test i mean the instructor was livid he was just pissed off he said how dare you i mean this guy in chicago said to me well can't you just pass her because she's my girlfriend and can't you just pass him because you know well hell he made it halfway through uh, can't you give him your black belt because of that? And, and uh, well, my other student, I mean, he's he started teaching, you know, and uh, shouldn't he have rank because he was teaching, you know? And I said, no, those are not good reasons to give rank. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's not a reason for me to, in, in um, Germany, I gave, uh, I did a test with four, three individuals, three guys. One was a 19 year old kid that did really good, real, did the best, I had two 40 year olds. Well, the, the, the one kid got knocked down the wrong door. He kept getting back up. You know, it did pretty good, technically. The second guy got up there. Uh, he, when we got to the almost to the wrong door uh, part of the test, he, he said, I quit I'm, and just ran off the mat. Mm 
he just he just left the dojo. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> uh, really weird. And that third guy, he, he was a mature guy, uh, but only in his about mid forties. And he was doing shomenushi. Well, I don't do shomenushi with my hand chop. Mm-hmm. I do shomenushi with something, and I usually use a, a you know a tanto in reverse. You know, like a, a, a piece of wood, or a mm-hmm. piece of pipe, or a piece of something. That's for my dantes. They do not do shomenushi with their hand. Mm-hmm. That because that's not practical. There's not there's not a person in the world that wants to kill you or hurt you that's going to go haya, you know. And stop before they hit you. True. They're going to hit a piece of wood or, or, or a piece of pipe. That's what I use. Well, uh, the guy that was uh, his uke, I said, Peter, you have to strike him. Be honest. This has got to be honest. It won't work if it's not honest. And that, you know, speaks to what you and I have been talking about, the honesty yeah. of the technique. Because if, it's, if, if you don't have an honest attack, if somebody's not really punching you, your technique's not going to work. Mm-hmm really won't work because it's it's not designed to work against a dishonest attack right you know something yeah that importance of honesty is crucial i I love that russian phrase that says it's better to be slapped with the truth than kissed with the lie and i think with martial arts that's that is it gets right down to it you know absolutely so anyway this guy he goes and hits you know he says okay well he goes and hits him he goes to strike him and you know this is a particular two particular avoidance techniques that you you have to know otherwise you're going to get hit and of course he got hit and it, you know he got a little bump and i said okay you're you okay i mean he said no i'm fine i'm fine i said okay well do it again and so again he got hit i mean square on the noggin boom Ooh. and and it was bad and i said okay you're done you're done and no he says i said no i'm, I'm fine i'm fine fine and so i said okay well this, one more time and you're done well then he got hit again and he went down and we called the paramedics and he got knocked out, you know, mm-hmm. just not. And I said, okay, that's, but, but you got to go back to the beginning of this test because I told the instructor, they're not ready mm-hmm. before the test. I said, they're not ready. And he said, no, no, no. I have to have you test them. They, you're not going to be back for a year. I want you to test them. He, he, they have, and I said, they're not ready. Mm-hmm. I said, no, no. He insisted. So I said, and, and I don't do this very often. I said, okay, mm-hmm. let's do it. And this is what happened. And wow. so I failed three of them. Anyway, he was livid with me. And, and like I said, couldn't get me to the airport fast enough. You know, mm-hmm. but be damned if I'm going to perpetuate dishonesty right. in, in our martial art because I love Aikido. I think right. Aikido is a valid martial way that people have an opportunity not only to embrace the, the, the philosophy, uh, which, by the way, I'll just mention this very quickly. When I was training with a man named Bob Koga, who I don't know if you've heard about him. He's no, taught not. all over the country. But mm-hmm. he called, he uh, created the um, Koga uh, Institute of uh, Defensive Tactics for law enforcement uh, okay. across the country. He was very, very well known. And he had trained under Koichi Tohei in Aikido for 25 years mm-hmm. uh, while he was a... Um, uh, I think it was a Los Angeles police, police department. Um, and so, but when he started, you know, I'm sorry, he was in Aikido for 25 years and then he became a policeman. And as he grew in the police department, they, you know, he wanted to teach. And so he got with Koichi Tohe and they developed his methods. Hmm. And so it became very well known. In any case, what I'm saying is that, uh, anyway, he died and but i was working with him he was in ventura he would come to ventura for two weeks out of the year and so i'd meet him train with him and we got to know each other quite well and i was working with a lot of police officers of his officers and yet so i was looking to get post certified but they wouldn't do it because they didn't want to trade out you know someone i'm not a cop Uh, my son's a cop now but i'm not i didn't want to be a cop i wanted to train cops but i didn't want to be a cop yeah, so it, it, you know, I was involved with a lot of police officers. Uh, every country I went to, I would have a law enforcement, you know, they would bring out their law enforcement officers and we'd have special training. And, and I, I had a lot of great experience with police officers, which I loved, again, because of the, uh, the no BS world they came from. But in any case, when Bob Koga died, 
or just before he died and the argument that they didn't want two Aikido teachers teaching the same stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat Miller, the chief of police at the time said, listen, Larry, you got to understand something. We don't really care that your technique is better because it is, and we know it is, but Bob Koga is there. When he goes into a court of law, he gets our guys off because he talks the walk of Aikido. That's his true value. Right. And that's the political value of Aikido. And fortunately, those, and now we're seeing the effects of, uh, you know, more and more police officers being poorly trained in the academy. They have poor technique, the more reliance on tasers and their guns. And, and their radios. And the, well, if they can get to the radios. Right. But, you know, the thing is that more, this is why cops are finding themselves in such a, a quandary of uh, mm -hmm. ridicule because, you know, too many innocent people are getting shot by, by cops. Uh, not that they, you know, it wasn't a legitimate mistake. But the thing is, those cops are going to their guns too fast because they lack the hand to hand abilities. Yeah. Now, you take my son who's trained with me for, you know, his whole life, he's 40 years old, and he went into the PD, and he's already not only been promoted, but now he's already part of the defensive tactics training team. Big mm -hmm. surprise, because yeah. he's good, and he's part of the SWAT team. And, you know, when they go into SWAT, uh, when they go into it as a, as a team, they always have assigned people. You know, you're the point man, you're the wingman, blah, 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 blah. You're the hands-on. Ryan's always the hands-on. Be, why? Because he's so adept with his hands, right? But that's what grew out of our Aikido. Yeah, uh, again, he doesn't know, you know, most of these guys don't know what they're walking into. And that's what I'm talking about. You've got to be creative mm -hmm. and be able to in that moment, right? You know, if anything, I think Aikido is probably the perfect fit for police officers because of the control. Like it's Absolutely. about apprehending and controlling. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but you've got to be able to avoid. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can't get to number two until you got number one. <laughs> that's why in, in my dojo, I have a golden rule is you don't get hit. That's if you don't do that, everything else is pointless. Just like you were talking about earlier. Punch, grab and kick, shot, stab. Yep. Because I, I've got, I've had so many, you know, police officers that I've worked with, you know, that have been stabbed, shot, hit with a brick and they know, you know, I don't really. As they say in boxing, protect yourself at all times. Yeah. You know, and that's that's an outgrowth of the value that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. I, I know we've talked quite a while here, and I do want to get to the last question, which we can kind of put in two ways: is where do you see Aikido going in the next ten years or twenty years or so? And we talked a little before the show about the influence of the virus and the lockdowns. Obviously, that's going to be a big influence. I'm kind of curious of where you where you would also see it if that was not really an issue but i don't know if we can get around it but maybe we could cover a little bit because well you know, politics and development are one thing and then obviously yeah. the outside influence of the lockdowns and stuff is going to be another one so what uh you what know you i give you an example tristan i i went to uh, just last year uh before covid uh i went up to visit with the doshu he had come to san jose mm -hmm. and uh, that was there's a whole story behind that I won't get into, but I was invited as a guest and, and uh, I, I went up there and uh, it was very interesting to me. They had about 500 people on the mat. Typically the doshu draws, you know, anywhere between a thousand, 2000 people on the mat. Of course, most facilities can't fit them. And so everybody goes there, stands around and he does his thing. And then, you know, because they, he's the doshu, right? right? But the thing that I know, I, I, I didn't train. I actually went up there to give him a gift, say hello and, and um, whatnot, because I had just gone through a hernia uh, operation. Mm -hmm. In any case, I, I spent the, uh, the day and a half that I was there with, it, with his wife in the stands, you know, commiserating with her and talking shop and, you know, because we're good friends. And, um, but the thing I noticed, and, and this was very important, out of those 500 people, I mean, I knew all of them. I mean, you knew a lot of those people, right? I mean, I trained with them. They're all Northern California, mostly. Uh, Pat Hendricks, you know, Kayla Fetter, uh, you know, all those people. Uh, Bob, Bob uh, Nadeau, Bill Witt, you know, those guys. And <laughs> the average age of the person on the mat, 500 people, I would say, was 
60 years old. Wow, that's that's a big number. I would say the average age was between 55 and 60 years old. Mm. I saw a handful, a handful of younger people. I mean, I'm talking about people under 30. Mm. Right. <laughs> I saw kids, you know, running around, you know, teenagers. But that was it. Mm. What was so profound for me is exactly this question. Because take COVID out of the equation. IQ is going to be dead. He's going to be dead in another 15 years. And, you know, the, the Josh Goldman, uh, I'm sure you've interviewed him. Uh, IQ. Oh, Josh he, Gold? Josh Gold. Yeah, actually, Gold. I'm going to be interviewing him tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, we got – he's coming on. I'll tell you. I mean, he did a survey, and and we met with him while we were up there in uh, – in San Jose, and he did a uh, uh, presentation on the decline of Aikido in the United States. And he's saying that it's, you know, declining something like 15% a year, which I believe. uh, I think, you know, there's many factors, of course, we can all, uh, you know. We'll never pin them all down for sure. Not not at all. But certainly the rise of MMA uh, and, and the competitive cage fighting and all that kind of stuff, you know, has certainly uh, caused the decline of like Aikido. More and more people are going to the more combative martial arts. And like I said before, a lot of Aikidoists are going and supplementing their stylistic martial uh, Aikido with combative martial arts. You know, they're going to, they're going to go train in jujitsu and, and learn the combative art to support, the, the Aikido that they don't believe in. And that's the sad part to me is that uh, these people that are doing that don't believe in their Aikido. Not that that, not that I don't, you know, enjoy other martial arts and seeing other martial arts. I do, but I believe in Aikido. If I could find something better, I'd go do it. Right. right? But based on my training, my teachers, uh, there's nothing better than Aikido that fits into this society today. Mm-hmm. any better than Aikido. Aikido is the solution, is a you know, solution. I've thought yeah. about the very same thing. And a number of people have asked me, is like, Tristan, if you're so into having this be practical, why do you stick with Aikido? And the answer is almost exactly what you just gave me because I love it. And if there was one, for one thing, if I was younger, I'm 52 years old now, but if I was younger, I'd probably go after Sambo. To me, that is probably the closest one to Aikido but for young, young people, like you, Sambo is not something a 40 year old person's going to start doing. Like it's just not in the cards, but I respect it because it, it, it deals with all the attacks. It deals with, from a physical aspect, it's combined judo and wrestling. And I've got an utmost respect for both of those. Um, And I, and I use those influences with my own Aikido because it's valid. They, They are physically solid, valid arts with no argument. You can't, you just can't argue with them. So, yeah, and you don't want to do that either because, and and what I was going to say, you not only uh, you know love it, but you love it because you believe in it. You know, a right. lot of these right. they they do it, and they're fifth degree black belt, sixth degree black belt, seventh degree, you know, but they don't love. I don't think they even believe in what they do. You that, know? And you know, that's the one thing that really does break my heart when I hear somebody say. You know, I've been in Aikido because I did a lot of asking around. And the question that I asked was, how, you know, how long did you train Aikido before you felt some some measure of confidence if somebody got up in your face? Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity. And I, and I ranged anywhere on the low end from eight to 10 years up to I've been doing this for 15, 20 years and I still am not that confident. And I'm yeah. like, you really don't believe in this art then. Yeah. And, and that that saddens me because of how far I think it has slipped. Well, <laughs> you, well, you see these people that come to you, you know, they're they're in their 30s. You know, they, they say, well, yeah, I've, I've got a third degree black belt in this. And I got a third degree black belt in that. I got a second degree black belt in this. And a, but I'm, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm a grandmaster in this, that, the other. And I, and I said, well, I'm, I, I'm really sorry that you're that confused. <laughs> Oh, that's a great response. They want to impress me because they've got 14 black belts, and but they don't know which they don't believe in any one of them because, it, you know, if they did, they would stick with one one thing right. and develop. Like you say, if you fall in love with something, and then th- that's one thing, but then you've got to fall in believing it, mm-hmm. believing. It. And like I said, when I 
the irony of my relationship with my former instructor who became very famous, very well known, is that he literally gave me the courage to leave him because he gave me the courage to believe in Aikido mm -hmm. as a way. And the, the, the ironic, <laughs> the irony for him is that he lost that. He, lo he completely lost that, sure. you know, he, he lost that passion for what it actually represented. And, mm -hmm. and that when he did that, then he, he lost himself and he was easily swayed to the dark side and used it for every, you know, everything stupid. I mean, it just didn't work and he started failing because, and then he started grasping. Mm -hmm. and, and in our art, you don't grasp. If you grasp onto anything, if you're not in that state of machine in that moment of attack, you, you'll get you'll get killed. You'll, you'll get whacked. You know, and I've heard a number of people voice the sentiment that by cross training in other arts, you're diluting or you are corrupting Aikido. And, and oh. I think I think the opposite is true. I think you're strengthening it. You're 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 putting it the heat to the metal to create the tempering and and creating the strength that the art needs to have. Right, because you're gonna you you know, I I, use, I sometimes I use the uh, term any dough. You know, I you say well, what do you do? I say oh, well, I do aikido. That's what I do, mm -hmm. right? That's what it's called. But sometimes I think that we should call it any dough. Right. <laughs> That's, you know, they, that's pretty good. As the thing is, if I, I love the thing, I mean, you bring me something that you want to practice. Okay, you bring me a knife, you bring me a gun, you bring me a, a poncho, you bring me a, a, a tackle or a slide tackle or a you know a heel pick or something like that. Let's talk about that. Okay, right. well let's study, let's study that. Mm -hmm. You know, show me a you know way that you want to do it, and, I'm, and, and we'll let's study that. You know, so whether you're a cop, whether you're a uh, special forces guy, whether you're at, right out of the Marines that you've been kicking ass for a long. I mean, I've had chief warrant officers, you know, come in. I have mean, SEAL team guys coming in and these are no BS dudes, right? And, you know, says, well, let's study this. I'm not going to compete with you. And if you want to, and you got to know that you're going to have those challenges. You, mm -hmm. I mean, people are going to want to come in and take you out. I had one guy in, in Chico want to want to kill me. He wanted to pay me $10,000 to fight him. And I said, I, I wouldn't fight you. You know, I'm not going to fight you. Mm -hmm. I, at the very moment that I thought that he was going to throw that punch. And um, it was interesting because I said, well, I got to go teach a seminar. This is right on the, right, I was five minutes before my st seminar was to start. And he, he said, no, you're going to fight me right now. And I'm going to kill you right, right now. And I said, no, nah, I, I got to go teach. <laughs> I said, if you want to do that on my mat, come, why don't you do it inside? I got 90 people in there. You can come inside and then you can rush onto the mat and you can kill me in there. Kill me in front of all my students. That, that, then that would be a really good way for you to embarrass me. But, you know, you've got a real big chip on your shoulder and you've got to kind of work that out for yourself. But I got to go. So I went. So anyway, he, he did come into the seminar. So mm -hmm. and this was a guy that was in. And the reason he was mad at me, because for four years, four years previous, I had called him. He said one of his students told him that I called him a, a, a name, right? Hmm. And that okay. this dude, and he had trained four years for this day to kill me on hmm. the mat. So I said, well, come on in. So he did. He paid to come into the seminar and uh, he sat down. And so, you know, I started my seminar and uh, I had 90 people on the mat. And um, so I started talking about the virtues of Aikido. You know, a way of solving our differences, peace, reconciliation, all this guy. He leaned over to my host and said, doesn't this guy ever shut up? I don't need this crap. And he left, you know, and, and everybody knew what was up because, he, you know, he had challenged me and all this kind of stuff. And I turned to everybody. And I said, well, now who won the fight? Right. And that's what it's all about. Being able to adapt and deal with that kind of adversity. Mm -hmm. And like you said, when you see something good, have an open mind to it. You know, there's yeah. wonderful martial arts out there. I've got a, a senior student in Silat right now that trains with me. He just loves what I do. Yeah, Silat's so got some great stuff in it. And and he still trains in Silat, you know, down in Los Angeles. Uh, but he still makes it up here to Ventura just to train with me for an hour and a half, you know, when we can get together. But, um, you know, it's the ignorant uh, Aikidoka that he thinks that 
they have all the answers. We don't. Right. I should promote an open mind, open mindedness. That machine, that machine uh, concept is about being open. And you know, if you if you're not, you're you're headed for the. You know, so so many inter, even intermediate, but certainly experienced martial artists. They have they have a gift for you, and by closing your mind, you say, "I don't want your gift." And what what it will leave you with is being poor. You, you your martial art will be will have be stricken with poverty. You'll be I like to refer to it as an inbred art. You'll just have something that's some little tiny specialized thing that does not have general practicality to it. Well, I think, and that's I'm, I'm sad to say that that's that's where it's headed i mean if it don't if it doesn't uh if you this is why you know i've enjoyed talking with someone like you that will promote aikido as a viable martial art can promote has found a way to do it uh um and certainly um the internet and your the social media is is part of the future and it's an undeniable part of the future because just by virtue of what's happened with the covid you have something that prevents us from teaching in our dojos. We have to go virtual. And because there's still value to what we do, if it's worth anything at all. Absolutely. You know, one surprise that I had when I started the uh, podcast, what is it, a year and a half ago now, and I'm, what, in 130 episodes or something like that. And I only realized this as I got into it quite a ways. And that is a lot of the stuff that I talk about on there. I will share with my students, but when we get on the mat, I don't have a 45 minutes to go into full detail about things that I want to tell them. So I'm able to use that as a as a an augmented tool for teaching. And I can say, go home and listen to this, because I don't want to take up your mat time when we're when our geese going on, yeah. you know, into, into this depth, but you can listen and you can learn a great deal. I mean, your mind is is the thing that really learns. And we can learn from conversations like this, from uh, people writing up, you know, their thoughts in blog posts and things like that. There's a ton of opportunity for us to learn, not just how we can do technique or the or the fine points of the physical part. And what I found is that if your mind is closed to the possibility of the physical, because it's what's going on in your head, you will never get the physical part down. Never. Right. Only when your mind opens up first can you get to the physical aspect. And so with this new medium, now we can start, we can spend time when we have downtime, building up in our mind what we want in our art, whether that's exploring our imagination, removing the mental limitations, because we all know martial arts training is probably 80% mental. Like there is a physical aspect for sure, but most of it's getting out of your own head and using your mind to control your body well. Well, I mean, look at what we're doing right now. I mean, we're, you know, miles apart, being able to share ideas and, and uh, you know, find uh, support for that passion that has kept us going for so long. Uh, you know, turning 70 is, is not an easy thing for me to do, but I, I don't feel 70. I mean, you know, right. everybody, you're what? And, you know, my, <laughs> you know it's, it's a, yeah, wait, it's, <laughs> I've been around a long time, but, but it's, it's, you don't, <laughs> the last thing you want to ever say, I tell you, especially in Japan, I've been in a situation where I was sitting in Osensei's kitchen with uh, uh, Hiroshi Isoyama and uh, a couple other high ranking instructors like Inagaki and others. And we were having this big party. And this is the very first time that I had an intimate time with him. So he wanted me to stand up and introduce myself. And, and at that time, I'd been training in Aikido for about uh, 38 years, something like that. Uh, 35 years, I think. And uh, so I, I, you know, I said, hi, my name's Larry Renosa. And uh, I've been in Aikido 35 years. And, and all of a sudden, there was just this burst out laughing. They just started cracking up. And he said, oh, 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 that's very funny, everybody. And Inagaki says, oh, man, you've been in Aikido so long. You're like my uncle. You know, you're like my uncle. And now Isayama then chimed in. He says, no, no, you've been in Aikido so long. You're more like my grandfather, you know. So for the, the, the remainder of the week that we were there with Isayama, he, says, he, he kept calling me his grandfather because you've been in Aikido so long. And that's the last thing you ever want to do is tell somebody how long because it doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. Like you said, 
rank doesn't matter. Well, I think it matters more than we'd like to think it matters in the, in the real world because of beginner students seeing you. If you don't have rank, they don't understand. You could be the, I mean, that's what happened with, uh, you know, my former teacher, you know, that they said, well, he, he was given rank. You know, I said, dude, <laughs> I don't give a crap if he doesn't have any rank at all. All you have to do is go experience a class from him. Mm -hmm. uh, th then you realize rank doesn't mean anything, you know, but he did because, you know, he was ranked and, and, and the only way he could promote us or, you know, be recognized is to be part of an organization, which he still was affiliated with the Ike Kai. But, um, but at that point you say, <laughs> I don't care if he's got rank, man, go, go have a class with him, you know, go yeah. train with him. Mm -hmm. And you'll realize that you'll, you don't have to, you know, understand what he's doing. All you have to do is feel the force of what he's doing. Right. And, and then you're a believer. And mm -hmm. that's what happened for me. And that's what gave me back my belief in Aikido. And it had it not been for him and his influence for the next 20 years that I gave him that, uh, you know, I, I, I would have got out of Aikido for sure. Sure. Well, yeah. we've been having a great conversation here. I just want to go with one more question. And that is, if you had one wish granted to you for the future of Aikido, what would it be? If you could have anything you wanted. Well, that it be seen as a viable martial art in the real world. That it that be not only be seen as that, that it could be taught mm -hmm. by people that have done the work that have realized the, the, the true value of Aikido, that not only the philosophy, but the potential. Mm -hmm. I wanna do, you know, I wanna do Aikido not as it was, because as it was, it, it was. That's not my job. My job as a student of 45, 45 years in Aikido is to have made it better. And when I say that, people react one of two ways. They say, wow, that's a great way of thinking of it. Or they say, that's, you're a heretic. You think right. you can, Better than Bo Sensei, and I said, "Yeah. Do you think? I, do you think these people today are building cars better than Henry Ford? You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, they are, and should be. There's, you know, people building a Model T aren't. You laugh at. IQ is a technology, and it has to be studied that way. If you, if you, any technology is going to evolve, but." There are those, what they call purists, that they say, no, 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 no. Our job is to preserve the tradition of Aikido as it was, because that, you know, and that's the Japanese way of thinking in, in many cases, in many cases, especially when it comes to martial arts that, that I found. Well, uh, any strong tradition has that, you know. Exactly. That respect. And, and I'm all about respect, certainly. I mean, Osensei was an innovator, 100%. Well. But I think he also advocated taking Aikido beyond where he took it it's just kind of sad that his students and and successors weren't as interested in that innovation as he seemed to be who are you talking about i'm sorry i missed about o sensei oh I, he's he seemed to be interested in having aikido keep growing which i think any founder would like why not take I, it beyond i have a conversation with him right now like we're having a conversation he'd mm -hmm. say that you know because i think and here's my ultimate uh, thinking is every teacher's goal is to have their teacher be I mean, their student be better than them. But Absolutely. That's, that's not what we see in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, we want power. We want to see dominance. We want to see. And, and that's the problem in, in most cases, because the most instructors have that fear of not being needed anymore because you know, there's their students better than them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had such a teacher. I had such a teacher, my very first uh, martial arts teacher, who was a, a dear man, a, a very good man, and he introduced me to Aikido. Well, I was a young stud, 25 year, you know, years old, out of Division Two football, great shape, strong, and blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And I was, I became his student. Well, very quickly, you know, this 40 year old, you know, kind of portly guy was having me run circles around him, right? And then I, he says, well, now you gotta go get ranked. So I went to Los Angeles and met Mitsunari Kanai. And of course he became my, you know, my uh, iconic teacher. And he was the one actually gave me my first black belt, Kanai Sensei. Uh, but then I had gone way beyond my first teacher. 
because he didn't want to go. He didn't want to go any further. He thought, you know, he wanted to stay in the tradition. And so, um, but, but we, we got to a point actually where we agreed to disagree. And, and that was good because he said, no, you got to go beyond me. You got to keep going. And, and I still remember that because I've always kind of come back to that when I talk to my, you know, students that I, you know, senior students, I said, listen, your goal has to be that your students are going to be better than you. And you've got to be, you've got to be free of, of that, you know, free with that. You've got to give up everything. And if you're, if you're going to live into, you know, perpetuity, so to speak, I mean, you know, you're going to do that with your students. It's mm-hmm. not going to be, you. you're going to die. You're, you're going to get old. You're going to get weak. You're going to get, you're going to get bald. <laughs> you know, and, and sadly it's, it's common for martial art instructors to want to be the big dog in the dojo and to, and to feel threatened if one of their students becomes better. And that, that's, that can be at odds with people. And, and I'm sad when I see that because it really puts a cap on what they can give their students. That's- they'll actually throw them out or say, you know, no, I don't want you here anymore because you threaten my dominance. Well, that's why they put that little, that little name tag on their shirt, master. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, so nobody that, forgets. Yeah. Yeah. Don't forget. I'm the master, you know, and, and it's just, that's such a mistake, you know, and I just believe that people have called me master this. And I said, please don't use that word with me. I'm nothing more than a student of Aikido mm-hmm. that has gone more than you and i the day that i stop being a student is the day that i quit because <laughs> absolutely bottom line bottom line the day that you 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 become that master you think that you're that master you you're done because yep. you have the same thing so yeah absolutely I, no and, and i'm really glad we could share our our passion for aikido and and even talk about why we haven't walked away or why we came back to it after yeah. getting to that point of being disillusioned but uh and I think with young people, they, they want to hear that passion. They want to hear why people are in, are into what we're doing. And if anything, this could be a very valuable lesson for, you know, younger middle-aged people. Why they, why would you want to, why would I want to take up Aikido? Why, you know, why would, why would I go train with a bunch of 60, 70 year old people, you know, and, and that's, I really hope that we, we can turn this into a play, turn Aikido into having a place where, we are, are focused on those things and at least not so much dominate Aikido. I don't think that the folks that are into the spiritual side or into the, the philosophical aspects, which I, I, I do respect both of those. I like them. They have their place. I'm big on, on philosophy, love it. And on the spiritual aspect, but it has to have the place where people can say, I just don't want to get my ass kicked. I want to have a chance to survive when faced with tremendous physical challenge. Um, and, and that's, without that's that what, answer, it's just that, philosophy. <laughs> that's true, but that's but that's where you that's where I've come to where I believe that what we're doing, the way that we teach Aikido, it can do that. And yeah, and, I, and I believe it too. So that's why I'm glad we can get together. That's part of uh, why we believe in it mm-hmm. is because we have that fear that we're going to get our ass kicked if some big dog comes after us. You know, well right. that after us well okay we'll deal with it mm-hmm. you know and we don't have that fear and that's what i'm saying our our the way that you train you have to start thinking about and, and go definitely read the gift of fear by gavin de becker because he gives you a a different perspective on how fear plays into whatever you're doing because it'll stop you in your tracks or it'll compel you to keep going you know yeah absolutely so, well, really great talking with you, Larry. I, I appreciate this. This has been uh, one of my favorite chats. So, um, you. you know, I think I think people get a lot out of it, and I'm very excited to put it up. So, if you have I'd anything like to, else you'd like to end with, uh, feel free. Well, I I'd like to just end with this: is that I'm I'm open to having conversations with anybody that has you know questions about. Uh, you know, the development of Aikido, I I hope and pray that people will find uh, the belief in Aikido that I found that it can live on into a a way in the future because um, it's, it's, it's on a downward spiral now. And it's, it's sad to see it uh, that, and Josh will talk about that, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. but he's a kid that 
you know, he was a teenager when I was training with him way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And now he's, you know, of course, he, you know, taking over a very important job of still spreading Aikido. And I, I, I admire him for that uh, because he can, he can be part of that, you know, that message that Aikido is, can be, can be real. You know, it can be uh, a solution for uh, the real deal rather than just a stylistic art form. And, uh, you know, I, I, people like Josh are important, you know, the young guns that way back then, um, he's a good kid and, and, uh, he'll do a good job. Excellent. Well, thank you again for, for joining me. And, uh, I look forward to, may I, I may be calling on you again, cause this has been such a great conversation. Anytime I, I have enjoyed myself. Thank you All right. for the opportunity. You bet. Take care my friend. Thank you. You too. Thank you very much for watching and supporting this podcast. Enjoy your training.